Are you new to building or even specking PCs? Are you looking for a hand understanding what parts to look for, whether that's in a pre-built PC or for the parts that you're going to build your own new system, gaming or not? Well, this video is for you. I'm going to run you through the different things to look for, the, the order of parts you should be looking at in terms of what you could decide first, and roughly a, a rough idea of what to look for depending on your use case as well. So do stick around. With that said, if you want to see more videos like this one every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, then do hit that subscribe button and the bell notification icon. Now, the first part I would recommend deciding on is your CPU or central processing unit. This is kind of the brain of your PC and determines quite a lot about your use case, determines what motherboard and RAM you'll use, and a whole lot else, so that's why I'd recommend going with this one first. Now there are two main brands of CPUs you can buy right now. There is Intel and AMD. For some context, AMD is known as or seen as the underdog here as they are an order of magnitude smaller than Intel, while still, at least in my opinion, offering some amazing CPUs. In terms of use cases, if you're just rebuilding the, the family computer or looking to get a, a new home office machine, for example, for web browsing, word processing, maybe a bit of you know, media watching, that kind of thing, then something like an APU from AMD, which is an accelerated processing unit, or basically a CPU and a GPU all on the same chip is a fantastic option. Now, Intel does do this, the same thing, they just don't call it an APU, and most of their mid to low end CPUs, in fact, basically anything that doesn't have an F in its name, so the I don't know, 9400, uh, that has integrated graphics as well, so those are both good options. Although in this category, AMD does tend to have better upgradability and a sort of service life, and so something like a Ryzen 3200G or 3400G is where I would personally recommend you head. Now for a gaming computer, which is probably the majority of people who are here, then there is a very wide range and it definitely depends on your budget, the type of games you play, and especially the resolution you want to play at. Now, assuming that you're on the lower end uh, kind of budget scale, want to play at 1080p, that kind of thing, then again, AMD's Ryzen CPU, specifically the 3600 or 3600X, are amazing value options. You get six cores that will run games plenty fine and give, give you a little bit of extra core space if you want to, say, do some streaming on the site as well. Now, you can run all the way up to their highest end desktop chips like the 37, 38, 39, 3950X chips. Those are all great options as well and it will depend on your budget. The higher end you go, the more cores you get and the, the faster a CPU you get as well as the way that they've uh, structured their scheme means that even their 16 core chip is actually the fastest gaming chip as well. So pick what fits in your budget. Now on the Intel side of things, there are some good options here as well. And in fact, at the lower end, they can be slightly better at 1080p gaming. Things like the 9600K, for example, can be a little bit stronger, but I would mention that AMD tends to have a better upgrade path here and has longer support life, like I mentioned before. And so my personal recommendation would be to towards Ryzen, although Intel still do have good options, especially at the high end like the 9900KS. Now if you do CPU heavy work like video editing or 3D modeling, it will depend on your budget what you're after here. You can go with anything as low end as a Ryzen 3600X, which like I said is six cores and should be plenty enough to even scrub through 4K videos if you need to. With that said, you can go all the way up the scale as well to their 16 core desktop chip, or if you're very serious about you know, your work, then you can go with their Threadripper chips or Intel's HEDT X299 chips as well. Uh, like this Threadripper, uh, these are actually physically massive chips. As you can see, they're almost the size of my palm. And these go all the way up to 64 cores should you need that. The next thing on the list is the motherboard. Now this is important as you need to match your motherboard to the CPU you got. And I actually did a full video explaining all the terminologies and the different chipsets specifically that you might need for the different chips that you pick. I'll leave that in the cards up above. But suffice to say, if you are going with a Ryzen CPU that isn't one of their Threadripper chips, then pretty much always you're looking at what is it called a B450 board. Uh, 
Um, that is their kind of mid to budget end uh, lineup, which supports pretty much any chip they offer and is a, a good value for money while still you know, supporting most of the features that they offer. Now, if you're in the higher end market, especially in those uh, 12, 16 core chip from Ryzen side uh, kind of chips, then their X570 platform might be a better place to head just because they tend to support those higher end chips a little better. And they also offer the PCIe Gen 4 support for those crazy fast SSDs should you need them for your workload. On the Intel side of things, while Intel does have a number of different chipsets available for their chips, I would generally recommend going with a Z390 motherboard as those tend to scale anywhere from the super low end all the way up to crazy high end extreme overclocking boards should you want that. Otherwise, in terms of the brands of the motherboards themselves, there are a number to choose from, although I've personally had good experience with ASRock, MSI, ASUS, and Gigabyte. Specifically, MSI's B450 Tomahawk Max board is a fantastic option for the vast majority of people who are building PCs right now, obviously if you're using a Ryzen CPU, and ASRock do a great line called the Steel Legend boards as well, which also are both Intel and AMD options too. Next up is your RAM or random access memory. This is the short term memory that lets your CPU know what it's doing next and all that kind of stuff, and you have sort of two main options or things to consider here. One is the capacity of how much space you need and also the speed and latency. Now, the speed and latency you do have to match to the CPU you're buying. Ryzen chips tend to prefer faster RAM all the way up to 3600 megahertz. Although there is a relationship between the megahertz, the, the clock speed, the speed at which the RAM runs, and the C or CL number, that's the cast latency or how long it takes to access data, uh, there's a relationship between the two where the faster you go, the slower the latency tends to get. And what you want to do is find the sweet spot between the fastest RAM possible and the lowest timings possible. For example, a cast latency of 18 on a 3600 megahertz kit can be slower in the real world than a 3000 megahertz kit that has a cast latency of say 14. When it comes to the capacity side of things, if you're building a home workstation, that kind of thing, eight gigabytes of RAM is plenty for you and you don't need to worry too much about the speed and latency. If you're building a gaming computer, then the speed and latency is more important, although you will want more, more or less 16 gigabytes. If you're on the, the super budget side of things, then you can get away with eight gigabytes, although 16 is what I'd recommend for the majority of people. If you're doing CPU heavy work, then you'll want more than that, and likely you'll want a whole lot more. For example, I edit these videos in 4K, I use my Panasonic GH5 to film them, and I regularly regularly use up to like 28 gigabytes of RAM just to edit these videos and for larger product projects I easily get close to the 32 gigs that I have in my system at the moment and so somewhere between 32 and 64 is generally where I'd head for that kind of workload although it can vary and especially if you're going with the high-end Threadripper chips you might want 128 or even more than that. Right next is the graphics card. Now if you're building that home PC and you've picked a processor that has integrated graphics like the AMD APUs I suggested, then you can skip this step entirely and move on to the rest. With that said, if you're building a gaming computer, this is possibly the most important part you can pick, so do make sure you get the right one. With that said, uh, there are two main makers of graphics cards. There is AMD, again, and Nvidia. And again, AMD is the underdog in this situation, but they're not quite as uh, in a strong position as they are in the CPU market. Now, which graphics card you want very much varies depending on what sort of games you want to play, the resolution, and your budget. If you want to play 1080p games, if you want to, you know, an entry level card, then something like a GTX 16. 60 Super or RX 5500 XT are both great options. If you want the uh, just best bang for buck card that's out at the moment and can even provide 1440p gameplay, then the RX 5700 XT seems to be the absolute sweet spot right now. But if you want anything higher end than that, then Nvidia is just uncontested and you'll 
pretty much have to pick whatever card you can afford in your price range. When it comes to the vendors of those actual graphics cards you can go and buy, there are again a number of options. People like Asus, MSI, Gigabyte, uh, XFX, Sapphire, um, Zotac, EVGA, and a whole load more all do great options. Although specifically Asus, might you might want to stay away from their AMD cards as they have had a few problems. And while they may have resolved them, there are definitely better options for the price available right now. So do shop around, check out reviews of specific cards before you go and buy them. Next up is storage. Now for a home PC then, honestly, a single SSD in the 240 to 480 512 gig uh, range is probably plenty. It's enough to store the majority of your family photos or whatever and important documents, but it's also going to be nice and fast and responsive when you do boot up the system. With that said, if you want to add extra storage, you can either do that by adding a one to eight terabyte hard drive into the build, or more likely, you can build or buy a NAS or network attached storage device, which would let you store all of those family photos, you know, Blu-ray rips, anything like that, on your network so that any device on your network can access them rather than just from that specific PC. Now, if you're a gamer building your next gaming PC, then you'll probably want a 240 to 480 gigabyte SSD as your boot drive, and then anywhere from two to four terabytes of hard drive space for your game library. Now, if you have a bit more money to spend, you can go with a larger boot SSD in order to store some games on there so that they don't take quite as long to load, but it will depend on your budget, so vary that how you fancy. And if you're in the uh, kind of more uh, workloads, uh, CPU heavy workloads, video editing, that kind of thing, then you'll pretty much want as much hard drive storage as possible. Again, with a boot SSD, although again, the larger the better, especially if you're using it as your cache drive. The case you put all of the hardware in also determines quite a lot about your system. It can determine what size motherboard you go with, what cooling, what power supply, and what size graphics card you have as well. So make sure you have a, an idea in mind for what size you want the system to be before you actually go and hard pick everything else. With that said, there are so many cases that are out there and there is just so much uh, options and personal preference available here. And so what I'll do is give you a, a few suggestions, a few um, ideas of where you might head, and then you can pick from there. With that said, Fantex is possibly my favorite case supplier on the market at the moment. They make cases that have been the easiest to build in by far. There are so many nice quality of life improvements in basically all of their cases that it makes it very easy for me to recommend them. With that said, specific cases like the P350X is a great budget option, and the Evolve X is a stunning tempered glass option that is uh, fairly high end, but also amazing to build into. Now, once you've picked both your CPU and your case, you can then work out what you're going to cool it with. Now, if you've picked a Ryzen CPU, pretty much all of them come with coolers that are pretty well matched to the CPU in the box. And so if you're on a budget, you can pretty much forget about cooling your CPU as long as you have one of those Ryzen chips. If you've got a higher end Ryzen chip though, or you've got a bit more money to spend, or you've gone down the Intel path, you will definitely want to pick up a separate cooler. Now there are two main categories here. There is air cooling, which tends to be either cheaper and or more effective, or uh, also just incredibly beefy and high end. And then there's also water cooling, which tends to be less effective at cheap prices, but can be more effective at higher ones. With that said, a few specific options, uh, like the Arctic Freezer 34 Esports Duo is a, an amazing, uh, fairly budget uh, single tower CPU cooler, comes with two fans, very easy to mount on both AMD and Intel, and performs really well. If you want a higher end option, then something like the Noctua NHD15, or I think it's Be Quiet Dark Rock Pro, then those are also great air coolers. And then on the AIO side, the, the water cooler side, people like Corsair do some nice options options like the H100i V2 or H100i Pro that I've checked out before. And lastly, there is the power supply, the thing that powers your whole system. Um, there are a few different things to, to bear in mind or uh, to consider when picking a power supply. First is the wattage, which is how much power it can output to your system. 
Second is the efficiency, which is uh, how efficient it is converting the AC from your wall into DC for the computer. And you're looking for an 80 plus bronze or higher power supply. With the higher the rating, the more efficient it is, and therefore the, the better power supply you're getting. You, you also need to bear in mind the size of the power supply and also the different types of connections or the uh, connection setups they have on the back. Now, when it comes to the uh, sizing of the power supply, this is pretty simple. For the vast majority of builds, you're looking for a standard ACX sized unit. Although if you're building in a specifically very small case, then you might need to look for what's called an SFX power supply, which will generally be labeled as such anyway. When it comes to the connection setup, there's three main types. There is non-modular, which means all of the cables that come out of the power supply and connect to your motherboard and graphics cards and hard drives, all come pre-hard attached, they're unremovable. You have semi-modular, which means you can remove a couple of the different accessory ones, like extra power for graphics cards or hard drives. And then there's fully modular, which means none of the cables come pre-attached. For the home build, a standard non-modular power supply is fine enough, although semi-modular can mean that it can be a little bit neater as you don't need to have any excess wires in the case. And when it comes to gaming systems, again, semi-modular is generally where I'd head. You only really need to go with a fully modular power supply if either the wattage you need is not available in semi-modular or you want to use fully custom cables and you basically have more money than you need to uh, build a system like that. And lastly, when it comes to the wattage, if you're building a home PC, something like a three or 400 watt power supply is more than plenty. You likely won't need anything else than that, especially if you're not running a graphics card. When it comes to gaming systems, you're probably looking at somewhere between 5 and 650 watts for your system, although it can vary and can go all the way up to, say, 800 watts if you're running one of the higher-end, say, Intel CPUs or uh, one of the higher-end Ryzen CPUs and one of the higher-end graphics cards, like, say, an RTX 2080 Ti, for example, you might want more, like, 650, 7, 800 watts available to you. And you only really need to go above that if you're running the HDT Threadripper CPUs and high-end graphics cards as well because otherwise you don't really need that much. Right, so that is a rundown of the, the main components you want to look at when building a PC. Now, if you'd like to check out any of the parts I've mentioned, I'm gonna leave links to them in the description down below. Those are Amazon affiliate links, so it will take you to the local Amazon store where you can see pricing when and where you watch this, because it can and does vary. With that said, if you'd like to see more videos like this one every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, then do hit that subscribe button with the bell notification icon. And if you have any questions about uh, building your PC or specking out your parts, then do leave them in the comments down below and hopefully the community will get back to you. Um, also, you can check out our Discord and the tech support channel that's in there. If you have any questions, feel free to jump in and ask and one of us will get back to you. Otherwise, if you'd like to see more videos in this Tech Explain series explaining CPU names, Names, GPU names, motherboards, and a whole load else, then you can take a look at the playlist at the end or in the cards up above. And you can also check out some more videos over there in the end cards when they pop up. Otherwise, if you want to support the channel and keep me making these videos on a Monday, Wednesday, and Friday basis, then you can take a look at the links in the description down below. There's stuff like merch or hoodies or t-shirts like this one. There's Overclock UK affiliate links if you're buying anything from there. There's also a Patreon if you want to get cool rewards like ad-free videos and support me directly. Or there's other affiliate links down there like Streamlabs OBS if you want to start streaming uh, and a load of other stuff, so do check them out. Otherwise, like I said, feel free to check out some other videos over there. And if you've got any questions, leave us in the comments down below. But otherwise, we will see you all in the next video.